the almost in the way that First John does, or um, John chapter one does, where it's a very uh, this is what the gospel is in a um, almost metaphysical sense, what we know from heaven and we know in a supernatural sense. And, the other, and then the other one goes through the gospel um, as we see it in this world. And so let's sing these together and just reflect on the gospel this morning.
there's mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and promise to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt resurrection in the end, Lord. Thank you for all that gospel truth. In your holy, precious name, amen. You may be seated. Good morning, Living Rock. Good to see everybody today. Tomorrow we start our VBS out at the property. And I want to thank everybody who worked so hard. We decorated a shed. That's hard to do. And uh, it looks beautiful, and looks like tomorrow's going to be great weather. So we expect a really good kickoff to our VBS. 
That'll be all, all week. And then next Sunday, here's the plan. Next Sunday, we'll have outdoor church, 10 o'clock at the farm property. So setup crews will come in here. We'll wait until Saturday afternoon. We'll look and see how the weather is. And if it looks good, we'll come in here Saturday. We'll bring everything out and we'll get ready for church. Outside next Sunday, Lord willing. If the weather's bad, we'll stay here. We'll be here next Sunday, but Lord willing, we'll be out there. We have some people lined up to be baptized, about six people, and I'm thankful for that. And guess what we're going to do? We're going to have communion. We haven't had communion in many, many months. I miss coming to the Lord's table, and so we're going to do outdoor communion. We're also going to pass the mic around uh, because we want to hear some testimonies of what the Lord is doing in your life. So think about a scripture or something you want to share. And, uh, and we're working on getting a food truck. And so we'll have burgers and chicken sandwiches and desserts. We're working on that. I'll let you know. Just watch our, our Facebook and so on for the announcement on that. But you may want to bring a bag lunch, too. We, we're, we're going to bring the tents and the tables so we can have a picnic together and, and be together as a church body. So that's next Sunday. And all week, we're just really looking forward to the ministry that God has for us this week. So let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the chance to be together this morning and have this time of worship. And we need it. As I said to, to Jim and Dan last Sunday, I just, I will never take morning worship for granted again. It's just so good to be together and to sing and to see your people and your body gathered. We were meant to be together. You made us for community. We're the bride of Christ, and, and I pray that you would do your work to fill us and feed us this morning through the word and through this time of worship. I pray we would be encouraged today. You would help us with our fears and anxieties and our worries, that you would answer prayers that we would pray even this morning. We depend on you. You're a good father. You're a great shepherd. And we are your sheep. We are your people. Thank you for the way you take care of us. Lord, I pray for this school, that you would help them as they reopen their campus here in the elementary school and the middle school. Give them the right plan and give, give the students great joy and good health as they regather in this building. I pray for all of our schools and the surrounding area that you would help our students to be safe and, and healthy and just, Lord, I pray that there would be a joyful regathering of, of all of our students in in this important time of education. <clears throat> I pray, Lord, for us, as we have not heard yet on where we'll be able to meet. And I pray, Lord, you would find us a place here at the school where we can meet this fall. We depend on you for that as well. We pray, God, for VBS that starts tomorrow night. Thank you for all the work and all the preparation and the volunteers who have signed up to come and work and serve and love on these kids. I pray that there would be great joy and love and peace amongst our VBS staff and families and children this week. And God, we pray for a joyful celebration next week outside on our church property. Lord, I pray for our nation. I pray that there would be mercy and justice in our nation. That the rule of law would be kept and understood and respected. And that wherever there is corruption in whatever place of our government, that you would root that out. And that you would bring in righteousness. Righteousness exalts a nation, the scripture says. And so, Lord, I pray that whatever is making our nation sick these days, we would turn to you. You would revive our people. You would strengthen our legislators, our executive branch, our judicial branch. 
that we would love to do mercy and justice and that we would seek to have a nation where people can walk humbly with God. We need you, God, all the time, every day, even this hour. We commit this time to you and pray that your will would be done in this hour as we gather together. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please stand with me.
So I want to thank Paul Kruger for helping me with my sermon prep this week. He shared an article Wednesday night at the School of Rock, and I said, I'm going to use that. That's, that's going to work real good for this section of Ecclesiastes. He shared an article by Dr. Erica Commissar. She's a well-known and respected author and psychoanalyst. I think that's good. Is that good? Psycho if I say it slow, it doesn't sound right. Psychoanalyst? That didn't sound right. Psychoanalyst, that sounds important. So she wrote in the Wall Street Journal late last year a piece entitled, Don't Believe in God? Question mark. Lie to your children. That was the title. She says, I'm often asked by parents, how do I talk to my children about death if I don't believe in God or heaven? And my answer is always the same, lie. In other words, tell your kids, there is a God, there is a heaven, even though you don't believe it. And why? Why does she do that? Science. Science supports that. She said there's a growing body of social scientific research showing that religion is good for people, especially children. So in her article in the Wall Street Journal, she says, I'm often asked to explain why depression and anxiety are so common among children and adolescents, and one of the most important explanations, and perhaps the most neglected, is declining interest in religion. There has been a 20% decline in church attendance the last 20 years in America. That's according to Gallup. The last 20 years, a 20% decline in regular church attendance. And 50% of adults under the age of 30 don't identify with any religion at all. So, Dr. Commissar references a large study done by Harvard. Children or teens who reported attending religious service, or at least once a week, scored higher on psychological well-being measurements. They had lower risks of mental illness, Weekly attendance was associated with higher rates of volunteering, a sense of mission, forgiveness, lower probabilities of drug use, and early sexual initiation. That's the science of going to church. <laughs> now we know there's more to going to church than just the science of it. We know the benefits of worshiping the Lord. So I don't know anything about this doctor's personal beliefs. I don't, I don't think she is a Christian at all. She's just following the research, and she's saying that raising kids in a godless universe is corrosive to human meaning. Nihilism is that fertilizer for anxiety and depression. The belief in God, she says, is one of the best kinds of supports for kids in an increasingly pessimistic world. So we're going to have kids together every day this week. It's just going to be a happy week, the happiest week all summer for all of us. Well, I think the preacher in Ecclesiastes would agree with this doctor. If there is no God, then everything is meaningless, completely meaningless. If there's no God, there's no, no true happiness under the sun. So we've been in Ecclesiastes now for two Sundays. Let me do a little review. So far, he's proposed two solutions to this meaningless, pessimistic worldview. Here's the two solutions so far. Theism and providence. That, the big idea of part one is theism. There's more to this world than just life under the sun. There's the creation, and there's the creator. There's the material world. There's the spiritual world. There's the world, and there's the word of God that became flesh and dwelt among us. If you live in a one-story universe where this world is all there is under the sun, 
you won't find any happiness here. That's what he's saying. So the cure is God, belief in God, in a worldview of theism, that God reaches into our world, into time, and he touches us with his grace and his gifts and his life. That's meaning. That's happiness. And last week we looked at God's providence. That's also a solution to a meaningless, meaningless life. He has a plan. He has a purpose. He has a time for everything that happens under the sun. And prov providence guarantees that all these puzzles in life, they'll one day fit together into God's big, beautiful picture. He makes everything beautiful in his time. What a great promise. So today we're in the third part of Ecclesiastes, where the preacher will again study theism and providence and test it against reality. Test it against reality. A, a worldview has to stand the test of the real world. Does my wor worldview stand the test of living in the real world? Is it livable? So here's the title today. And I'll help you, Andy. I'll say next, all right? I'll try to remember to help you out. The title today is Studying Happiness Under the Sun. We're going to look at Ecclesiastes 6, 7, and 8. Here's the outline. There is happiness in all circumstances. Ecclesiastes 6, 1 to 7, 14. There is happiness in inward character, chapter 7, verse 15 to 29. And there is happiness in a civil society, chapter 8, verses 1 to 14. So, next slide. There is happiness in all circumstances. You know, we all probably assume that prosperity brings happiness and adversity brings unhappiness. But that's not necessarily true. And so the preacher in Ecclesiastes is going to take a deeper look at prosperity. And he's going to say, prosperity isn't always good. Let me read a few verses here. God gives some people great wealth and honor and everything. This is chapter 6, verse 2. He gives them everything they could ever want. But then he doesn't give them the chance to enjoy these things. They die, and someone else, even a stranger, ends up enjoying their wealth. Well, this is meaningless, a sickening tragedy. Verse 3, a man might have a hundred children and live to be very old, but if he finds no satisfaction in life and doesn't even get a decent burial, it would have been better for him to be born dead. His birth would have been meaningless. And it would have ended in darkness. Verse 5. Or verse 6. He might live a thousand years, twice over, but still not find contentment. Verse 9. Enjoy what you have, rather than desiring what you don't have. Just dreaming about nice things is meaningless, like chasing the wind. Prosperity isn't always good. Wealth, health, dreams, nice things. But the preacher says that doesn't guarantee happiness or contentment. Not even if you had 100 kids and lived to be 2,000 years old would you find happiness and contentment in those things. Why? Along with those things, you have to have the power to enjoy them and the gifts and the power to enjoy these things come from God. Without God, you cannot enjoy the good things that he has given us in this world. God is the giver of all good gifts. Look at how miserable some of the wealthiest people are in the world. Without God, they don't have the power to enjoy what they have, and they keep chasing the wind and wanting more and more nice things. There's two things going on here. Not only receiving things, having prosperity, but the other gift is the ability to enjoy what you have. Those are two separate gifts. And many people who are prosperous, they lose the joy of what they have. That's very sad. So prosperity isn't always good. On the other hand, adversity isn't always bad. Chapter 7, 
A good reputation is more valuable than costly perfume. And the day you die can be better than the day you were born. It's better to spend your time at funerals than at parties. Verse 3. Sorrow is better than laughter. For sadness has a refining influence on us. Verse 5. Better to be criticized by a wise person than to be praised by a fool. <laughs> Verse 8. Finishing is better than starting. Anybody can start a race. It's finishing the race. That's where that adversity kicks in and that happiness kicks in. Patience is better than pride. Verse 10, don't long for the good old days. That's not wise because that means you're not living for today. And today is the only day you have. Today is the only day we have to live. We don't have tomorrow yet. We don't have yesterday. We have today. And when you're always, always longing for the good old days, you're not living your life fully today. And then verse 12, only wisdom can save your life. So this section <clears throat> contains the eight beatitudes of adversity. The eight beatitudes of adversity. Adversity can be a blessing in disguise, just as Jesus said, blessed are you, and when he listed all those eight beatitudes, and in that list is a lot of adversity. The adversity of keeping a good reputation of, of death, of sorrow, of, of handling rebuke, of endurance, of patience, of wisdom. A lot of pain can bring a lot of gain, right? A lot of trials can really increase our toughness. A lot of difficulty can be disguised. Opportunities can be disguised as difficulties. They refine us. They grow us. If I were to give everyone today a million dollars as you walk out the door, in six months, I might have the most miserable church in Minnesota. <laughs> oh, you'd be happy today. I know you. And Monday, you'd be happy. Tuesday, you'd be happy. You'd be happy for a few days. But if I had just handed you windfall wealth, you might be miserable. And we may have a mess in our church. Have you studied the lives of people who win the lottery? <laughs> you don't want to be that person who wins the lottery. Just one mess after another. Windfall wealth is just no good for us. So in short, I think what he's saying is, don't judge a book by its cover. Don't, don't look at people and say, oh, they must be happy. Oh, they must be miserable. It's not always that way. Prosperity isn't always good. Adversity isn't always bad. The Puritan Thomas Watson said, people are usually better in adversity than prosperity. A prosperous condition is not always safe. True, it's more pleasing to the flesh, but it's not always best. You think back over your life. You've had days and weeks where you would say, we were prosperous. You've had days and weeks, years maybe, <laughs> of adversity. Which do you cherish more? Which did more good in your life? Pastor Ethan had some, had a group of leaders and kids hiking up by Gooseberry Falls last weekend. He told me one day they had to hike 12 miles. Now, he did his homework. He, he said the trail, the, the state park department said, yeah, it's, it's uphill. Well, then they got going on that 12-mile hike, and the first eight miles was not only uphill, but they were climbing rocks the whole time. Adversity. Eight miles of rock climbing, it took eight hours. I'm sure, I'm sure they were so thankful for that adversity. Then they had four miles to go. That was easy. That took an hour and a half. Now that's a story to tell. Thomas Carlyle said, for a hundred that can bear adversity, there is hardly one that can bear prosperity. I will say this. If you turn on the television, you'll see a lot of prosperity preachers. 
I think I've found a new niche in ministry. I'm going to be an adversity preacher. Because <laughs> I just think it's better for people. God does more through adversity than he does through prosperity. Now, he can send both. That's up to him. And both can be a great blessing. And I hope you all experience a little bit of each. But let's not look at just the outside and say prosperity is always good and adversity is always bad. The next slide is Ecclesiastes 7, 13 and 14. Accept the way God does things. For who can straighten what he has made crooked? Enjoy prosperity while you can. But when hard times strike, realize that both come from God. Thank you, Lord, for this trial. Thank you, Lord, for this blessing. I know you've sent it as a gift to grow me. Help me to be wise in this season of my life. Remember that nothing is certain in this life. So God's providence does pass the test of happiness. Whether he sends prosperity or adversity, both come from God. And we should be thankful with whatever season we're in. Secondly, there is happiness in inward character. And let me read now in chapter 7. Verse 15, I have seen everything in this meaningless life, including the death of good young people and the long life of wicked people. So don't be too good or too wise. Why destroy yourself? On the other hand, don't be too wicked either. Don't be a fool. Why die before your time? Pay attention to these instructions. For anyone who fears God will avoid both extremes. There is happiness in inward character, and that's first characterized by avoid extremes. I did read one commentator this week who said this is one of the most difficult chapters in all of Ecclesiastes to understand, so let me take a shot at it. I think what he's saying here is don't be too wise in your own eyes. Don't try to outsmart God. Don't think in some mechanical way that if I just do this, then that will happen. This is this uh, formula for success. Do this, everything will be good. It doesn't always work that way. Don't try to outsmart the Lord. Don't, don't try to outsmart the way this life is. And, and also, don't try to be so spiritual you end up self-righteous. It's self-destructive to be a know-it-all. Nobody likes a holier-than-thou attitude, so avoid these extremes. Some of the unhappiest Christians I know are those who try so hard to be spiritual. It's just not real, and it's not the happy life. I remember about Martin Luther when he entered the monastery he almost killed himself doing penance. He'd sleep outside in a snowbank, trying to get rid of his sin and trying to control his flesh, mortify his flesh. Well, he, he did pretty good at mortifying his flesh. He'd sit in the confession booth for hours. He was miserable, miserable, until faith in Christ came to him that day, and he was free. He was alive. That's the answer. Extremes in behavior reveal a lack of character. Extremes in behavior reveal a lack of character, even in a Christian. And then he says, be virtuous, verse 29. But I did find this. God created people to be virtuous, but they have each turned to follow their own downward path. Virtue. That leads to happiness. What does it mean? To be virtuous in character means to find and fulfill your purpose in life. So if there's no meaning in life, there's no virtue. If there's no purpose in life, no virtue is possible. How do you build character in a purposeless, meaningless world? So virtue is finding that purpose 
and fulfilling that purpose. If your life lacks purpose, how are you going to build virtue? Because virtue needs a purpose. No virtue, no purpose, just a downward path away from the Lord. So there is happiness when we avoid extremes, when we seek virtue. So this section here is all about character. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of character and the beginning of more happiness for you. The next slide is Billy Graham. He said this, When wealth is lost, nothing is lost. When health is lost, something is lost. When character is lost, all is lost. Study the lives of people who are chronically unhappy, and oftentimes there's a weakness of character that is an underlying issue. So happiness comes through an inward character. And then finally, there's happiness in a civil society. Now this chapter 8, that took me by surprise. I, I thought I was reading in Romans 13 when I was reading through this, because it's all about the civil government. I thought, wow, what's the relationship here with happiness and civil society? Happiness is good governance and a civil society. There's a relationship. How much unhappiness is in the world as a result of bad governance and a sick society? Let me read a few of these verses. Verse 2. Obey the king, since you vowed to God that you would. Don't try to avoid doing your duty, and don't stand with those who plot evil. For the king can do whatever he wants. His command is backed up by great power. No one can resist or question it. Those who obey him will not be punished. Those who are wise will find a time and a way to do what's, what's right. And then verse 11, when a crime is not punished quickly, people feel it's safe to do wrong. But even though a person sins a hundred times and still lives a long time, I know that those who fear God will be better off. He's, he's, he's basically saying, you know, it seems like crime pays. Because you can rob the corner store a hundred times and nothing happens to you. But I know it will be better for those who fear God. Verse 13, the wicked will not prosper for they do not fear God. Their days will never grow long like the evening shadows. Verse 14, and this is, and this is not all that is meaningless in our world. In this life, Good people are often treated as though they were wicked. And wicked people are often treated as though they were good. This is meaningless. And that would be a sick, civil society. You know, many cities have a broken window policy. Have you heard of that? It says that if there's a broken window in any neighborhood or street or alleyway, that first time that window is broken, the authorities should step in and stop it and fix it. Otherwise, you're just going to encourage more people to break more windows. As I read in verse 11, I'll read it again. When a crime is not punished quickly, people feel safe to do more wrong. Norm Geisler said, one of the signs of a bad government is a slow government. Just slow. Slow to react when wrong is done. Punish crime quickly before crime escalates. Just think of what happened in our town, the Twin Cities. One window was smashed in May. Nothing happened, and 1,500 businesses and buildings were vandalized, and 150 were destroyed. It took 7,000 Minnesota National Guard to bring peace back to our Twin Cities. Isn't that sad? And look, look at the devastation that will go on for years and decades to rebuild our 
city. No civil society, no law and order, no happiness. That's the connection. There can be more happiness in this mixed up world if we have a civil society. Viktor Frankl, he said there are two races of men in this world, but only these two. He said there's the race of decent man and the race of indecent man. Both are found everywhere. They penetrate into all groups of society. No group consists entirely of decent or indecent people. I like that. There's two groups of people in the world. Decent people and indecent people. And they're everywhere. So keep your eyes open. If you see something, say something. And be salt and light. There's happiness in a civil society when decent men and women penetrate our government and our streets. There's reason for more happiness. Verse 3 says, do your duty. And part of that duty is to serve your community and to do your civic duty as a citizen in our country. You may wonder, what does that look like? Well, let's, let's go to 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 4. Next slide. Where Paul says, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Now, that's a prayer guide right there. Pray for all people. Ask God to help them intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. That's a prayer guide. Now, this next section is a voter guide. Verse 2. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. So a civil society needs a praying people. A civil society needs engaged people. People who vote. People who promote peaceful living. Vote for those who promote peaceful living. Vote for the ones who value godliness and dignity. Vote for the ones who desire to do good under God. And vote for the ones who will protect our liberty to be Christians and spread the gospel. A civil society can be a happier society for everyone. Amen. So what's the conclusion to this section? Next slide, Ecclesiastes 8.15. So I recommend having fun because there's nothing better for people in this world than to eat, drink, and enjoy life. That way they will experience some happiness along with all the hard work God gives them under the sun. Now Solomon isn't changing the subject here. He's not telling us to overindulge. He's not telling us to go get drunk. He's not telling us to become a hedonist. He's not saying life is short, so let's play hard. He's saying life is short, so pray hard. Life is short, so work hard. And promote as much happiness as you can in this world under the sun. Happiness in all circumstances, that's in prosperity and adversity. Happiness working on our inward character, avoiding extremes, being virtuous, staying on purpose, that purpose to which God has called us. And happiness to work for a more civil society, praying for our leaders, our president, our governor, our, our police, our first responders, praying for our neighborhood, and engaged as citizens to do right, to do good in every neighborhood. I was thinking about how the world celebrates happy hour. You know, that's the hour after work. What's he saying here? He's saying celebrate all the happy hours at work. <laughs> that's the happy hours. 
Celebrate and enjoy your life. That means the hard work you have to do this week. That simple meal that you can have, that cup of coffee, that conversation. And follow these prescriptions to bring as much happiness as we can in our life. Amen? Let's pray. Father, what we have just read is bread sent from God to feed us, to help us, to nourish our souls and our minds in the ways of God and the will of God. Lord, this is, a, this is an uneven, unbalanced, unpredictable, puzzling world. And Lord, you have put us here to share your life and your gifts, to build and to grow the body of Christ in a more civil society. And I pray as we go, you would fill us and use us, help us and strengthen us, encourage us and teach us to be salt and light where we go. We do pray for our president and our governor and all who are in authority over our lives, that they would be at peace, that they would promote peace, that they would understand their authority is delegated by God, and may all of their policies, all of their decisions, be under God and promote a civil society. Lord, we need you more than ever these days. And I pray we would do what we can as a church to be a blessing to our town and our neighborhoods as we go. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing before we go today. So we're going to sing a a new song that's an old scripture. Um, and let's sing this and bless each other by it. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon. Be gracious to you. Lord turn
May grace and peace go with you. Have a great week.